The haunted house is one of the most enduring motifs in English literature. From Walpole's Castle of Toronto to Shirley Jackson's Hell House, Stephen King's Overlook Hotel, there is something in our imaginations that is always looking for grim echoes of the past in every building of a certain age, it seems. A haunted house also stands at the center of Joyce Carol Oates' 1980 Gothic deconstruction, Bellefleur. The Bellefleur Castle, as it is called by the provincials who inhabit the titular family's vast estates, is a moldering, mutantish accumulation of splendors, slowly creaking and rotting as its inhabitants fall victim to madness and death and their family's dreadful curse. However, unlike many of its peers, there are no literal phantoms walking the halls of Bellefleur Castle. Merely strange men and women bent under the weight of countless years and the stories they have bundled around themselves to make sense of the world within and without the manor walls. Oates is not a true believer in ghosts and ghouls, but believes that we can turn ourselves into such things under the right circumstances, with the right amount of fantasy applied. And maybe we all live in the castle. Maybe we all could turn into such a thing. Maybe we are all such a thing in this strange country called America. Join us to discuss this weird and wonderful house of horrors on the Infinite Library. Bellefleur Manor was known locally as Bellefleur Castle, though the family disliked that name. Even Raphael Bellefleur, who had built the extraordinary house many decades ago, at an estimated cost of more than 1.5 million, partly for his wife Violet and partly as a strategic step in his campaign for political power, grew vexed and embarrassed when he heard the word castle, for castles called to mind the old world, the past, that rotting graveyard Europe. So Raphael frequently said in his clipped, formal, nasal voice, which sounded as if it might be addressed to a large audience. And when Raphael's grandfather, John Pierre Bellefleur, was banished from France and repudiated his own father, the Duke de Bellefleur, the past simply ceased to exist. We are all Americans now, Raphael said. We have no choice but to be Americans now. So begins uh, Joyce Carol Oates, 1980. Opus, Bellfleur. And that is what we're here today to discuss on the Infinite Library. My name is John. My name is Ben. Thanks for joining us again this week, Bookheads. Yeah, I hope you're ready to discuss uh, many frightening apparitions, uh, evil cats, psychic children, uh, people that disappear into mirrors and never return, various other uh, spooks, and uh, horrific sights that you can't even comprehend. And the real horror of it all, America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perhaps the most horrific thing of all. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about today, guys. Um, ben, I have a question for you as we get started here. Uh, do you have any relationship with Joyce Carol Oates? I so um, I'm glad you asked that because I feel like Joyce Carol Oates gets assigned in uh, short story or MFA classes um, because as far as I can tell, she's quite a master of the short story form. And the one that usually gets assigned that I've read in at least two classes is where are you going? Where have you been? <laughs> Which many people and perhaps you're familiar with it, John. Many people describe it as what if Bob Dylan's It's All Over Now, Baby Blue was a short story. And the person who comes down to the window and asks the virginal girl to come down is a combination of both Bob Dylan, Elvis and Satan. <laughs> and so and he and he asks this woman to come down, basically, and she has to leave with him. And that's how the story ends. Uh, so I'm really only familiar with her in that context. I've not actually read any of her books. Yeah, uh, I had heard of that short story. I personally never read it, which is a bit of a blind spot for me. 
And yeah, to be frank, I had also never read any Joyce Carol Oates at all. Uh, this episode, frankly, was a bit of a, a mercenary pick on my part because I'd been wanting to give her a shot for quite a while and just had not been able to fit it into my own reading schedule. So I decided to make you do it with me. Well, and she has a fairly uh, omnipresent uh omnipresent present she's fairly omnipresent on twitter i would say <laughs> uh in terms of just kind of shit posting and and being a pretty good poster overall i would say yeah amazing that a woman who was born in like the 19 like 50s can like post like that like i think in terms yeah. of like great posters of that generation it's it's her and our man djt like no one else does it like djt and jco no they, they they really don't putting up huge huge numbers <laughs> uh but yeah so joyce carolitz i did do a little bit of research on her just kind of to give us a little grounding uh before we dig into the book itself because she is just such like really a singular figure i think in like american letters at this point All right, so joyce carol oates uh born oh i'm sorry born in 1938 <laughs> wow. uh, yeah in uh, Lockport, New York. So she is currently 85 years young. Uh, <laughs> but she is someone she's been writing for decades at this point. Like I said, she was born 1938. This book came out in 1980. So she wrote this like just on the cusp of being 40 years old. And she's continued to write since then. Uh, as of today, she has written 58 novels, as well as several collections of short stories, uh, poetry, critical nonfiction, uh, as well as some novellas and whatnot on top of that. So, yeah, truly like one of the most prolific writers, I think, still working today and kind of seems to show no real sign of stopping. <laughs> I, I just looked at her Twitter and it's a lot of her just now posting about how great bluegrass is and uh, posting pictures of her cat. Uh <laughs> And referring to cat food as being only seven dollars, which is why Biden will lose. <laughs> so this disgusting meal cost me seven ninety eight. The food was awful and there wasn't nearly enough of it, which is why Biden is so unpopular. And then it's just a picture of her cat with the cat bowl. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she anyway. got into a fight uh, last week. I saw with uh, Matt Sitman of the Know Your Enemy podcast. I don't know if you're a listener to that. I am. But uh she was arguing about whether or not the Bible like was a thing that you could basically quote with any authority. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I guess Matt Sitman quoted some passage of the Bible about how should we, we should care for widows and orphans and, and Joyce took offense to the idea that widows need to be taken care of. <laughs> uh, Damn. <laughs> to, wow. to which I say, I, I understand you are, you are a widow Joyce, but uh not not every widow has been writing incredibly commercially successful novels for over 40 years. And 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 also we didn't say Bell Fleur is like 600 pages. Like she can really crank them out. Yeah, so. no, I mean it's it's impressive. I mean, yeah, when you when you couple the fact that this is yeah, like a 700 page novel, uh, and she's written 58 novels that I I like I don't think this is necessarily like an outlier in terms of the length. Like it says a lot about her work ethic if nothing else yeah yeah but uh yeah just just a really prolific writer and again very commercially successful despite taking like a, a pretty literary tack uh very concerned from what i read here and also like what i've read about her work and you know you know very interested in kind of uh human depravity <laughs> uh particularly of the gendered variety. So a lot of books about kind of male psychopaths preying on uh, women and uh, yeah, de definitely like kind of writing in a kind of like, I think more of like a horror uh, register than maybe I, I realized, you know, I've, I've heard her name for forever. I'm sure like I, I sure I've seen her books millions of times, you know, just walking through bookstores and, and things like that. But I really was not familiar, you know, uh, uh, to quote the great Shaq, you know, I apologize. I was not familiar with your game, Joyce Carol Oates. <laughs> and too, like, and we'll talk about this later, but uh, 
Belle Fleur has a lot of like suspenseful scenes that then do become horrifying. <laughs> so like she has the setup and the payoff. So it's not like this sort of, you know, literary horror where it's all about like, oh, uh, we're never going to get to the actual scare. It's like, no, you do get there. And yeah, it is yeah. like kind of scary. So, yeah. So um Definitely interested to like check out more of her stuff. Again, there's 58 novels, so <laughs> uh, you have a you have a s excess of riches here. Uh, if Joyce Carol Oates be the food of love, play on. I will have Sir Fight of it. <laughs> I'll have excess. <laughs> well, of it. Also, also to quote her, it's to quote the the John Gardner review of Belfer when it came out. Uh, he describes the reason of for her popularity as. Uh, her work tends to be appealing partly because her vision is huge, well-informed and sound, and partly because their readers like suspense, brilliant descriptions and sex. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can't disagree. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if this is a, a thing where it's if there's a lesson to be learned here in terms of like what could what could contemporary writers be taking from Joyce Carol Oates to like be successful. But I do think that there is a a balance she strikes very well between sort of thematic and literary aspirations. And also, again, yeah, just giving us the sex and violence that is uh, biggish American consumers we've been trained to to crave <laughs> since, uh, yeah, we've been whelped. <laughs> and yeah, there's like, and I'd say, you know, we'll see how much we end up talking about it, but there is quite a bit of sex in Bill Fleur. It's It's pretty raunchy book. It's pretty steamy. Uh, so to kind of to place this book in like kind of the wider range of her career, um, she is definitely someone who has always been interested in kind of, again, semi gothic ideas, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of violence, a lot of like human cruelty and depravity. Uh, but Belle Fleur comes in a period of her career that's sometimes referred to as like the gothic quartet, uh, which from what I saw found in my research is another one kind of like the great Chinese novels where it's a quartet of which there are maybe five members. So, uh, yeah. So the, the four uh, <laughs> kind of canonical ones are, are this novel, Belle Fleur, uh, the mysteries of Winterthurn, my heart laid bare. And then um, the Bloodsmore romance. Uh, so <laughs> you can definitely tell there she's, she's really riffing hard on those kind of classic Victorian Gothic uh, just sounds with, you know, things like Bloodsmore and Winterthurn. And then there's a more recent novel that came out in 2013, I believe, called The Accursed, which is also sometimes considered to be one of her Gothic works uh, in, in this same register. Uh, but I'm a little less familiar with that one. Yeah, John, to be honest, I didn't even know this was a Gothic book when we decided to read it. And that first chapter is like uh, a something horrific is knocking at the door and waking the entire family up. And I was like, <laughs> damn, I didn't I, I was like, I was not ready for this. <laughs> like, like, like I was really into it, but I didn't know it was gothic at all. I just assumed it was like a like, you know, a realistic family novel. So, yeah, you know, I went in. I was kind of expecting something maybe a little more. Not not realist necessarily, but like this is what my cover looks like. Listeners, I know you can't see this, but my cover has like kind of a it's it's a, a very nice edition, uh, from what I can tell uh, uh, of of this this imprint uh, put out a a very nice run of of I believe just the gothic novels with these very interesting kind of flat portraits, uh, but it's it's four women like in masks like sitting on like a very old uh, like Victorian style couch, and so I definitely had like a bit more of a vibe that it was going to be gothic, but I was kind of picturing something a little more um, whimsical, maybe like I was definitely expecting something yeah. more in like the 100 years of solitude type vein, which I guess is still like a pretty like dark novel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was expecting something with maybe a little more like of a whimsical kind of atmosphere. And, and yeah, I was a little surprised by how dark things got and how quickly they took that turn. Yeah. And like, a lot of death as well, so which we will get to. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, uh, just to to be quite frank, listeners, this is going to be kind of a hard one to do a a, a summary of, uh, just because there are so many characters, and we're going to talk a little bit about the way the narrative time moves in this book. It's not normal 
Uh, but bear with us. Uh, get, we're going to give you just kind of a brief rundown of what happens so that we can kind of provide a framework to, to discuss. So, right. Uh, yeah. yeah, things start off with uh, the arrival of a cat. Uh, one, uh, yeah, as, as Ben was saying, the, that first chapter, it starts on a, a blustery, rain-soaked evening uh, when the, the house is all quiet, except for the passionate lovemaking of, I'd say, our, our two primary characters, Gideon yeah. and uh, his wife, Leah. Uh, Who, uh, it should be noted, are cousins, because I yes. think that's important. Yeah. Yes, so uh, they're, they're cousins. Leah comes from kind of a, a cadet branch of the family, I guess, uh, but is is a bell fleur um, through her, her mother's line. Uh, so we'll kind of talk a little bit more about her, but uh, it's disturbed by the arrival of this, this strange cat, Mahalalil, uh, who it is said kind of serves as a harbinger of, of things changing. So Belfleur Manor is, is kind of this, yeah, terrible Gothic castle that's it set somewhere in high in like the kind of Adirondack region of New York or a region that's supposed to resemble the Adirondacks. Yeah. Uh, and from there, we kind of just follow the history of this family that all inhabits this this manor house uh, kind of through their past and up to the complete destruction of the family and kind of like their doom. Yeah. And you get several generations of the Belfleurs and the narrative kind of constantly jumps between um, those generations in a way that they're all kind of layered on top of each other, uh, which I think kind of speaks to like how this novel presents time as the past being uh, more important than the present. Yes. So there really isn't like a plot per se. It's mostly episodes where we follow uh, different characters through kind of different periods of time. Uh, Gideon and Leah, like we said, are probably our two, like the closest thing we have to protagonists and that they have probably the most chapters that kind of take place from their viewpoints. But everybody kind of gets a, a turn in the driver's seat, so to speak. You know, yeah. they'll mention a character in passing, you know, in an early chapter, and then you'll be halfway through the book. And it's like, oh, you're going to learn about what's going on with this person. And uh, Oates does a really fun job there kind of using those uh, those kind of side characters to provide these great little vignettes where she riffs on kind of her favorite gothic themes and ideas. Uh, but yeah, for instance, there is um, one of the ants who only comes down when it's dark out and is said to never really eat anything. And then when it's her turn in the narrative, it's implied that she is dating Dracula. <laughs> So, Swedish Dracula. <laughs> yeah, Swedish Dracula, who has just a little bit of Persian blood. <laughs> and the and the Belflers, they keep asking him about the Persian blood in this like really weird way where they try to look down on him and they're like, oh, he's he's such a nice Swedish man, the way he deals with my boorish. But he family. looks so Italian. But then at some point it's a, <laughs> right, right. And then at some point it's implied that yeah, he's basically Dracula and he's been seducing her down the dark path. Uh, and then I, I then her story kind of ends, yeah. actually. I don't know how that. Well, again, like ends, like we said, but, like there's. Yeah. Well, they all end the same way <laughs> then. Well, uh, right, yeah. Yeah. So the, like I said, this book really doesn't have a plot. It's it's vignettes and uh, yeah, just kind of these episodes in, in the history of this family and like the individual lives of those members. And so uh, if you're here. Well, and if we wanted to. If we wanted to say the the over like arching episode would be that like Leah has a child and through this child, she realizes she can sort of see the future because the child has psychic abilities and she kind of does through bearing the child. And as a result, she decides to reclaim the former glory of the Belfleurs because they had owned a, a lot of land. Uh, and then it got diminished and she's like, we're going to get back. We're going to make the Belfleurs great again. And that's kind of like the I would say the overarching plot. But as John had said, it's mostly about all of these side trips and it only occasionally refers. Yeah, back like to we that. don't really see that happening. Like there are references to it, but they're mostly in the background. Uh, and then it yeah. all 
again, uh, uh, spoilers if you <laughs> don't want spoilers, but this is a book that's very hard to talk about without kind of, hey, they basically tell you what's going to happen. They don't give you the exact specifics, but you know from basically like, the jump like oh by the end of this book uh the whole family is going to be dead and uh the inevitable doom will have fallen on the hell house of uh bell flower uh but yeah so while leah is using her kind of erstwhile psychic powers to try to make bell Fleur great again uh she's pushing away her husband <laughs> who uh has a series of mistresses and uh, basically gets so much pussy it drives him insane uh until he <laughs> does a 9-11 on Belfour Manor and literally flies a plane into the house and kills everyone. Yeah, he, he flies a plane into the house. The plane also might have a bomb in it as well. Like, like they refer to like a box in that episode that is and like the woman he's dating agrees to do the 9-11 with him. <laughs> like also, but yeah, like he uh, one thing that they establish is that he's always obsessed with like speed. Like he loves horses. Then he gets obsessed with cars. And then the final uh, obsession is like airplanes. And then, yeah, he he ends up 9-11ing the plane into the Belfler Manor and killing almost everyone except the daughter who he dropped off at the in-laws house and the super chill in-laws who honestly sound like some of the best Belflers because they don't get involved with any of the scheming in the manor. They just hang out across the lake uh, and make like quilts and stuff. And th that's like the cool part of the family. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... <laughs> That's about as good of as we're as close as we're going to get to like a plot summary. Uh, but we'll we'll kind of be much like the book does. We'll kind of be backfilling <laughs> here as we talk uh, yeah. with, with kind of vignettes and episodes that that kind of are relevant to the thematic discussion. We're, we're really here to have, to, to have. So. Like we've said uh, <laughs> many times, as, as we've referenced, this is very much a, a book kind of in the gothic mode uh though i'd say it is like a postmodern gothic uh rather than than kind of a traditional or an american gothic yeah as i well. mean yeah you know it's interesting I, I there obviously are like american goth like there's obviously the whole southern gothic tradition but like obviously when you think about like the gothic you you really mostly think of english novels i i'm kind of struggling to think of like kind of yeah high like american novels from like the high gothic period uh that kind of fit that same mold i'm sure there are some i just don't know of them off the top of my head uh so i i there is a there is a gaddis book called american gothic but i yeah i i can't i can't name any american gothic yeah books um again like kind of at least outside of like the southern gothic tradition <laughs> so listeners something ben and i have, have kind of struggle with a little bit over the course of this show is uh the gothic uh we've talked about probably half of the books we've talked about could be uh in some ways described as gothic and that's something we were like kind of struggling with a little bit when we first started the show was uh especially those first three episodes we did on on uh name of the rose castle of toronto and the ring it's like we got to do some not gothic stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm I'm having this like uh, strange episode of, of madness where I can't escape the gothic. And every time I think about like, oh, I want to read that book uh, or I hear about a book that sounds interesting. I find out that the book is gothic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, not again. <laughs> John, perhaps it's your distant relative who was a doomed uh, gothic writer and his his ghost is uh, extending into your present uh, and uh, for and basically insisting that you take this path. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But I do think that there is something very interesting, like with Belle Fleur and also just kind of more broadly with uh, kind of the gothic in modernity or post modernity, I guess, where. Like the. The Gothic is, is such like a strange thing because like it's the first genre that like we could at least in terms of, again, like English language commercial fiction. Yeah. Uh, which at some of like the fact that the genre makes it trashy. But it's also very old and like there are all these like classic novels that maybe were like considered to be like commercial and trashy in their day, but through time have kind of been grandfathered into like being canonical. Yeah. And so the Gothic is is very odd in that compared to like 
Tolkienian fantasy or like uh, the Western, maybe, you know, kind of these other more commercial genres. The Gothic feels like it's a lot easier to riff on in like a literary way. Yeah, because all you need is sort of like a big tortured family, a giant castle manor, uh, some ghosts, uh, maybe some weird unexplained phenomenon. And you need suspense where something is about to happen that's really scary that may not actually happen or does or sometimes does come to pass, sometimes doesn't. But some of the early gothic stuff is basically just suspense and not like the actual shock of something horrific, which yeah. uh, Joyce Colors does do as well. But but that's one part of it. Well, I think there's also the element where it's like uh, a, a the gothic is like very psychological, which kind of given the kind of mores of of modern literary fiction, which tends to be very interested in character. Yeah, I think that that makes riffing on on the gothic like very appealing to certain authors. I think that the fact that like we're all familiar with like the tropes of the gothic, even if we're even for people who like aren't particularly well read, like because of things like, you know, black and white horror movies and, you know, uh, even like goosebumps, like people kind of know what to expect from a gothic story. And so you can make references in a way that maybe you couldn't to some other kinds of genres and expect your audience to kind of be on board with you. Yeah. Uh, and in, wasn't in Frankenstein written in a contest to write a gothic novel? Yes, actually. Well, yeah, kind of. I don't know if it was like, again, I don't know if they were explicitly saying like, oh, we're going to write something gothic. But yeah, that was part of kind of the famous uh, trip that uh, Percy Bryce, Percy, Percy, Blythe Shelley, uh, Lord Byron and uh, Mary Shelley all, all took, I think, to a lake in Geneva uh, where, yeah, they wrote that or she wrote that. And then some okay, other. It looks uh, like it was the best ghost story. So it wasn't yes. specifically gothic, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one other characteristic of the gothic, I think, it, as particularly in Belle Fleur, uh, that makes it. it an interesting genre to riff on in kind of the postmodern uh, age of literature is that the Gothic has always, I think, relied pretty heavily on ambiguity. So like the vampire was uh, a figure that kind of exists, was placed in Gothic literature because really what they wanted to write about was like rape, but you couldn't do that with like Victorian censorship standards without like, terrifying people or you know scandalizing people and so you you use these supernatural elements as kind of a way to talk about things that you weren't allowed to talk about and i think that joyce carol oates kind of takes that and then does this interesting inversion in this novel where a lot of the supernatural elements are not necessarily explained away all the time occasionally they are but they are always presented in such a way that they could be mundane or uh, purely like psychological uh, episodes rather than being genuinely supernatural. Yeah. Or as we'll talk about later, issues of race and class that are then transformed into the supernatural, in my opinion, so that the bell flares can deal with it. <laughs> because it seems like to me, the, the it, this book comes across as the gothic is what the bell fleurs tell about each other uh, to get by. <laughs> like, it's like yes. it's the it's the, the myth that the family creates about itself is what sustains the gothic vibe, I would say. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. And yeah, in fact, let's let's talk about that. So I think the core, like, like you said, this is a, a story. This book is about the story the family is telling about itself. Yeah. So we know that that uh, Jean-Pierre Bellefleur is falls out with his father, the Duke de Bellefleur, and is forced to immigrate to America, uh, which is, again, at some of them already like a very picaresque, like kind yeah. of a, a place to start the story. Uh, but core to the kind of Bellefleur experience, one of the the biggest stories they tell about themselves is the Bellfleur curse, uh, which comes up basically as a whole chapter dedicated to it early in the novel. Uh, the curse is really kind of, 
again, interesting because normally, Ben, I don't know about you, but when I read like about curses in books, usually they're pretty like spelled out. What's yeah. like, they know where the curse began and like what it entails. Uh, the bell fleurs don't. <laughs> There's no consensus about uh, who cursed them, why they were cursed, or even what the curse entails yeah because uh, at, at one point it's like uh, the curse is like oh men will do this and women will do that but then at some point it's the curse is just that you will die <laughs> like, the, the, yeah. well it, the the closest thing that we get to consensus is that the belfler curse is that uh belfler men die interesting deaths uh <laughs> but it also has something maybe to do with gambling and uh, right because yeah they're all horrible gamblers all the belfler men they love to risk it all. So. Yeah. But then we also we see like the deaths of several Belfler men and like, I don't know, uh, seems like they die interestingly about half the time and half the time die perfectly mundane ways. <laughs> right. And then like the, one of the last deaths at the end is uh, Hiram gets gets scratched to death by a cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which could be interesting, but also might not be. But again, it's it's not like. At one point, again, late in the book, uh, one of the Belfleur wives is talking to her husband and, and is basically freaking out about the curse and how, you know, he, he has done something that is clearly going to, like, bring the, the wrath of the curse down on him. He's like, there's no curse. Like, even the, like, the Belfleurs, like, clearly do not even fully believe in the curse. It's a fun story they tell themselves to make sense of their reality. So when yeah. someone dies in, like, a horrifying or strange way they can say oh it was the curse and it makes sense but it's a game it's it's a, a story that they're telling to make like a chaotic world like make sense and to keep themselves like centered in that chaos yeah and a uh, one that i think of in terms of the like the duality is one of the bell fleurs whose name is escaping me right now there are a lot of them um becomes obsessed with a mirror in what is known as the turquoise room, which is a room that I believe uh, the first Belfler, or whoever the one who, who built the castle, had it built so that like royalty could be entertained there. But then at some point it becomes the room of contamination. <laughs> and what happens is, is one of the, the Belflers gets so obsessed that he spends hours and hours in this room uh, and he doesn't realize any time goes by. And then literally the mirror swallows him up. Now, what does he see in the mirror that he gets swallowed up? Well, he sees uh, figures of black men and women. And at some point it is revealed that that he just married out of the family. He just married a black woman. But everybody either says, oh, he disappeared into the mirror or he went to the other side. And they don't <laughs> explain exactly what that means. So like from the Belfleur standpoint, leaving the family to marry outside of the family, especially to another race, is like you're just you're eaten by the mirror. Like you 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 have some like horrific experience with the geometry of your house that you then just disappear. And then the wall get the, the room gets walled up and nobody ever goes inside of it. There's no one no one goes inside the turquoise room. So again, yeah. very very interesting inversion there. Uh and and yeah I, I think that you know I think that there's there's something there kind of about I mean obviously like you said that's that's like a very like racial element of the story and and there are a lot of like racial episodes in in this book but I think that like there is this element where like that's kind of what like Joyce Carol Oates I think is saying like this is kind of what America does yeah uh that we we have these kind of grand stories that we tell about this country that uh whether they're like gruesome or beautiful uh, or gruesomely beautiful, as the case may be, they are always kind of in service to this delusion, this this story we're telling to make sense of a world that is fundamentally like unknowable. Uh, another kind of interesting little bit of like Belfleur ephemera that the family repeats over and over again uh, that I think ties very directly into this is that Abraham Lincoln uh, faked his own death after the Civil War ended with the, the assassination we all know about <laughs> and that he actually uh, came and stayed at Belfleur Manor as a guest until he he passed away at some ambiguous point later in the future. Uh, again, they, 
it's never explicitly spelled out whether or not it's true. It's always left very ambiguous of who this person is, whether they were the real Abraham Lincoln. But I think that like the idea of Abraham Lincoln not being this martyr for America, that he maybe was like so beaten down by life that he decided to, yeah, uh, do a uh, a false flag on himself so that he could go live in this weird man like weird gothic castle in the adirondacks uh you know it it would if we found out that was true it would really like upset a lot of the foundational like stories we tell about this country and like the men who built this country in particular and too that like from the Belfer standpoint that he would come stay at our house you know like, yes. like yeah like a uh, great big beautiful house yeah like like yeah so yeah, I don't well, know. It's like interesting. That, yeah, yeah. Because the Belfort, you know, again, he says we're all Americans and there are, you know, intimations throughout the book of like the way that the Belfleurs have been involved in politics. The uh, the elder Raphael Belfleur had these plans to to become a senator. Uh, they're always talking about how he had these plans to to pursue political office that ended up getting uh, derailed when his brother killed like 11 people, <laughs> which, which we should talk about that later because like the fact that that happens again is crazy too. So yeah. like he literally does it again. <laughs> but, anyway. but like the, at the end of the day, like there, there is always this intimation that the family is, is really the only real thing to these people. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're involved in, in like broader social life. They're involved in politics. Like, somewhat casually like they're members of like the republican party uh you know during the civil war and then his brother of, becomes a local sheriff at one point yeah but really like the the idea is basically that the only people who are real to them are the people who live in the manor even like the Belfleurs, who uh whether by choice or by like being part of kind of like lesser branches of the family live in other places uh basically don't exist and are, are one step above kind of the, yeah, the common people they view as like animals. Uh, they talk about the, the Port Oriskany uh, Belflers who yeah. they, they derisively say never amounted to being anything but middle class. Uh, they just <laughs> own two blocks of the town as well as some yeah. shipping concerns. And like uh, the ones, the ones that live across the lake. And at one point the daughter Germaine goes and stays with them. And she asks the guy that took her there. I can't remember which member of the family. Why don't we just stay here all the time? Like, it's so much better here. And he goes, ah, we can't do that. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, And like, also, it's cool, too, that like the aunt or that they stay with there uh, makes these quilts and the quilts are like impossibly complicated, have really artistic titles and have like weird uh, like layering and, and stuff and like one of them is just supposed to like represent time and time is all like knotted and, and overlapping and stuff like that. And like it's a cool little bit of like I don't know what the word for it is, but whenever a big novel has something that's described, it describes the big novel inside of it. <laughs> like, this happens all the time. <laughs> if you write a book big enough, at some point you're allowed to just do a riff in the book that describes the book you're reading. I feel like that <laughs> happens almost in every big book you can think of. But anyway, um, so, yeah, like that that side of the family is a lot chiller. But instead, like they have to live at the center where there's all the scheming and the passion and the arguing and, and that kind of stuff. Well, speaking of that quilt, you know, Ben, I, I know you had some thoughts about kind of, yeah, the way time works in this book. Y yeah, it might be useful to also real quick read what she says in the beginning, because I thought that this particular uh, note from the author is like really hilarious for how. Uh, get with the program it is because <laughs> I feel like I feel like most most authors notes don't do that so and it relates to the time issue as well as to the idea of gothic being sort of treated realistically so this is what she says uh, before you get the table of contents this is a work of the imagination and must obey with both humility and audacity imagination's laws that time twists and coils and is now obliterated and then again powerfully present that dialogue is in some cases buried in the narrative and in others presented in a conventional manner that the implausible is granted in authority and honored with a complexity usually reserved for realistic fiction the author has intended. Belfleur <laughs> is a region, a state of the soul, and it does exist. 
and their sacrosanct, its laws are utterly logical. <laughs> so <laughs> I also want to note, too, this is just a quick note. Uh, it's interesting where she uses adverbs. There was somebody I, f I had online that noted her use of adverbs because I think generally adverbs are considered like um, the like calories of writing. Like you're not supposed <laughs> to use too many of them. If you use them too much, your writing becomes fat, you know, like so. But like she always uses them very particularly. But anyway, in that intro, she's like, OK, listen, I'm taking some stylistic risks. And one of them is that time is knotted. And so I think. One way that she could have presented this novel is to do it, um, you know, uh, methodically. Yeah. Generation one, generation two, generation three. Do and the in grand some ways, historical and, epic. Yeah, like, historical straight epic, on through. St yeah, straight on through. It, it, this often gets compared to 100 Years of Solitude, which kind of does that. But also things get more complicated in that book as they get complicated here, where basically like. Uh, you know, somebody will start telling you about something and then they'll have to jump in the past to give some background to explain what just happened. And I think this ultimately speaks to her point that time is, yeah, convoluted. But and that, for instance, the past is more important than the present and in some ways constrains the present. But, you know, characters are still able to have some semblance of free will because, for instance, there are characters that leave the family and whatnot. But there are ones who are doomed to do the Belfleur curse and they almost can't escape the past. Uh, and for instance, we haven't talked about my favorite Belfleur, which we should talk about at some point. Bromwell, who is this <laughs> uh, this genius child who is like only like four feet large. And he like stays in a tower in the castle and is constantly like categorizing and making notes and looking at his telescope. And at some point he gets sent to boarding school and he had been secretly depositing money in a bank so that he had enough to just leave the boarding school. And then he just moves to an observatory in like in Arizona or something. Anyway, <laughs> um, he becomes like a student of time and he ends up like talking about how like, yeah, the past and the present intersect so that it's all just kind of one thing. And I think that's kind of what she's speaking to, like a conception of time where past, present and future are all like on the same plane and they're all on top of each other. And there's no like escaping the past, just as there's no like getting into a future that's radically different. Now, what does that have to do with the idea of an American Gothic? That's I'm a little unsure of. But I will say that I think if you're thinking of the term of, as John was saying, of going to America and having to create like a new myth to kind of deal with the chaos and the um, sort of. I don't know, fraught potential of America, then it kind of makes sense to present time as like happening all at once. Cause it's like, yeah, we're going to America to have a new break, but, and, but then once we get there, we have to start telling each other things to get by. And that's how it sort of like keeps repeating itself. Uh, so I don't know. There's a lot going in here. What, John, what do you think about if maybe I'm wrong about the time conception, but how do you think the time fitting in? How do you think it fits in with the idea of like American Gothic, if we want to call it that? Yeah, I mean, so again, like you said, that's a that's a really big question. Like the way I almost was taking it was like something that that the book does is that there are parallels that get drawn between characters in the past and characters in the present. So there's two germains. So the whole Belfleur line as it currently exists at the 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 start of the novel, um, which again we could talk about this but the the time period the book itself even kind of like takes place and is left very ambiguous there's yeah. a, a family tree at the beginning and the like oldest members of the family like have like set birth and death years and then once you get past like the second generation it's all just blank there's no like it's completely ambiguous like exactly when these people were born and like when they're living and like what a like what year it is like in the book like obviously yeah, there's it, like yeah you could maybe piece some stuff together by like what cars and planes are available like when we get to those chapters but um like it's it's very ambiguous <laughs> like it would not surprise me to find out that like oh those cars and planes either don't exist or uh they're like from radically different periods of time <laughs> There's also uh, that bit where it's implied that like Gideon aged 20 years when Germain the second only aged like 
one four <laughs> like, or four yeah 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 it, but at the end of the book it says that she's four years old uh which is kind of the only real sign we get of yeah the actual like real passage of time insofar yeah. as it, it exists but i was taking it almost as kind of this thing where again like this is a gothic novel so i was thinking almost like these people are possessed by the ghosts of these stories yeah like there there's a point towards the end where one of the the really like grisly stories in like the past of the bell fleurs is uh what leads to to germaine kind of being the the mother of the the whole family as it currently exists uh and that is that there were two brothers uh louis and uh jedediah yeah jedediah uh was in love with his brother Louis's wife, Germaine, and he was so in love with her and so tormented by it that he decides to move uh, away from the manor and uh, go live on a ma- one of the mountains and basically become like a, a holy hermit. Yeah, and, and to see the face of God, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and I'd say he's probably, again, after like Gideon and Leah, he's probably the character we get like the third most viewpoint chapters from and we see him like kind of struggling like wrestling with god or like his really like i think the implication is more he's wrestling with his mind as he's like sick with some kind of like worms (laughs) up on this mountain like he's he's a soft boy he shouldn't be up there but he he doesn't die unfortunately the rest of the family does uh well he's been up on the mountain louis and germaine have had like three kids and like are are kind of yeah, being kind of the prosperous side of the family. And then they are all massacred by uh, some local, like, hooligans, basically. Yeah, who the resent Varels, their, right? Yeah. Their wealth. Uh, at least that's the story that, again, they tell themselves uh, that they were murdered for that reason. And the uh, brother this, uh, this family. Who wasn't there. Yeah, the brother who wasn't there comes back and kills them uh, in, rev- like, the people that killed the family. Yes. And then... Uh, Jedediah has to marry Jermaine, so he kind of gets this thing that he wanted, but in this like very twisted like way. Yeah. And they go on to then be the the uh yeah, the progenitors of kind of the, the family as it currently exists. But there is the the there's some discussion of like they are every generation like argues amongst themselves whether or not they should tell this story to the youngest generation and they always inevitably end up doing it and always ends up confusing the kids because they're like well why didn't they just kill those people (laughs) like why did they let them die uh and so again the the violence kind of becomes cyclical uh the stories these people tell about themselves and how they are like different and better than the rest of like their community or the rest of humanity, like it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes the curse. It becomes all these bizarre uh, quirks and sort of like demoniacal like urges that these people have yeah. that drive them to do stupid, dangerous, you know, suicidal things. Yeah, the 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 one thing we haven't talked about is the Belflers are constantly like doing hijinks where somebody gets killed <laughs> like 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 they go like t- tobogganing and then they don't tell the new guy to jump out and he literally and they literally and they dies. don't care so they much constantly that they, placing it like, takes, bets. like they can't yeah. realize who they know someone died but it takes them like three hours to figure out who it was because they just didn't even register who yeah. this this guy was because he was he was uh, a man who'd married from outside the family but like was not like a prominent like yeah mem- and they like prominent enough member of like another aristocratic clan for them to care yeah and they're like oh he's finally fitting in he's getting along with the bell fleurs yeah and then they just do like a suicidal tobogganing run and then they don't tell him that they're gonna jump and he crashes and dies and then like when gideon starts flying a plane he starts like suicidally like flying his plane through all these like dangerous stunts and stuff um yeah, it's like they, you know, uh, they're they, uh, they in some ways that's kind of oh, yeah, absolutely too, like death drive kind of like the sex and death yeah, drives yeah. like intertwined. I mean, like you said, so Gideon becomes obsessed with, yeah, like speed and 
something again kind of the 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 plot as it is is again lee is trying to make Belfleur great again and gideon like starts feeling neglected and so he becomes obsessed with speed and with sex as kind of like a way to deal with his wife like not caring about him anymore whereas like when they were young before uh germaine was born kind of this weird cursed child who whose powers give leah the ability to like take over the family business so to speak like they were both like super horny for each other all the time yeah and and that's also where i think the the sex stuff comes in because like at some point like gideon's like why does she like having sex with me so much and he's like is it because of <laughs> me and i and i think like like the to me the implication is that like yeah the desire it just itself is just so overpowering that leah loves it not that she yeah. just loves one person like the fact that it's Gideon well, almost is like in the incidental. Book, there, there's so. a lot of passages where she's like lamenting the fact that she married him and not uh this other local aristocrat nicholas fur who gideon accidentally kills in a horse race yeah uh, speaking of which so so with the way that situation is presented it's almost like leah psychically caused it to happen but since like J Jace Carol Oates is like presenting both, could it just be that Gideon made it happen because he was like he was risking it? Like she kind of presents yeah. both of them at the same time. Like yeah, both yeah. explanations. I mean, again, like happened. like everything. Like even like Jermaine's powers are are left very ambiguous. Uh because that's yeah. what Joyce Carol Oates wants well, to I, do. I, I do I did want to bring up something. So at the end of the book, as we've been saying, it, it the the, the <laughs> Gideon does the 9-11 on the Belfler Manor, and then the narrative jumps back into the past to Jedediah coming back off the mountain to resume the Belfler line. Now, uh, John, do you think that something similar is happening to the surviving members of the Belfler Manor who did not die in the plane crash? Because, like, if you think about it, like, uh, Bromwell left to go to the observatory. Jermaine is with the in-laws who are cool. Um... There's other members of the family that decided to just leave the family. Uh, one of them became an actress and nobody recognized it. Do you remember that bit where they go to see a movie and they recognize yeah. Yolande, I think. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Raphael, not the original Raphael, the child that is neglected. But also, uh, well, well, I'll get to Raphael in a second. Raphael's like, oh, isn't that Yolande? And everyone's like, uh, what are you talking about? That's not her. <laughs> like, like, who? <laughs> yeah, who? But so Raphael, by the way, is uh, the guy. So Jedi is always on the mountain in the narrative. Raphael, not the original one, the more recent Raphael child is always just hanging out by this pond. And I think it's implied that he's like neglected, that like nobody really cares about him. So then at some point he just disappears. Like, like, like some people say he went underneath the ground where the pond went, where the pond got absorbed by the land. And they're like, oh, fuck, he's down there. But they're like, oh, we didn't care about him. And I guess he literally just left. Like, well, something. I mean, yeah. I think I think it's again, it's it's ambiguous, but I think I got the implication that he just drowned himself. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, again, kind of one of the, the initial events in the book is that he is. Yeah, he's he's like a young child. He's playing at this pond. And one of the like local town boys, like one of the farmer's sons, like basically sneaks up to the pond and like almost kills him with like knocks him out with a rock and like he almost drowns. So I almost feel like it was like kind of a thing where he, he went full circle there. Like he, he, yeah, yeah. that was, he was destined to die and he, he, yeah, let the, the pond take him. Yeah. And, and I think the language even sort of implies that he's like learning to breathe underwater in that situation, which of course you can't, but it's like, oh, it's way better at the bottom of the pond. Like you're well, safe. Well, it's a here. story again. Yeah. It's a story he's telling him. Like his yeah. brain is telling him, oh, you're good. You're learning to breathe the water, and actually, no, he's just drowning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, even well, like the yeah. bell fleurs, like, oh, he went down under the ground with the the pond, and it's like, oh, that's just you guys are telling yourselves that because he committed suicide, and you can't yeah. grapple with that fact. But to answer your question from earlier, I think that like that is why gideon does what he does so because it ends the family lay yeah. out what he does so germaine is again kind of this strange child uh so gideon basically tricks germaine on like her birthday he says like i'm gonna take you for a ride in the airplane and then yeah he drops her off with like the cool in-laws uh, across the lake uh 
Bushi has said in the past, like, oh, I want to live there forever. Right. Uh, yeah. And then he. Yeah, does 9-11 to Belfleur Manor. <laughs> and so I think that the implication is that, again, Belfleur Manor is this stultifying place. It's this place where nothing can change. Like, it's very odd. You know, again, there's this curse where it's like, oh, Belfleur men die interesting deaths. There are a lot of deaths in this book, but like, there's also a lot of people living to be like ancient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like a lot of the, the really like elderly, like early generations of the family at, at this point, like the, the, they have, a grandmother who's like over a hundred years old when the book ends. Uh, and I think there's kind of this implication that like, Oh, like this family, like should not exist. Like this is they're They, they are trapped like yeah, in this yeah. house by like their own, like monstrousness, whether that's metaphorical or literal. Uh, and they are like having, like, they are like holding back like progress in a way. Uh, like, in the in a way that like yeah aristocracy like naturally like they're they're holding like this region of the country in like their feudal like clutches like like right, dracula yeah. you know and gideon <laughs> yeah. who's this character who is obsessed with like speed and in a way like with progress because like what else like that's what i think the metaphor is with like his his progression from horse to car to plane like he's someone who believes that like you need to go out and like live life, but he's been trapped. Like yeah. he's the only Belle Fleur who like kind of, he he goes out and he has like affairs with like local women at like these kind of seedy bars, but he's the only Belle Fleur who like has like a, a social life really outside of these kind of stultifying aristocratic circles. Yeah. It talks about how he has friends, his airplane friends. It's like, yeah, Gideon had friends, but he didn't really believe in them. <laughs> so it's like what this, <laughs> the narrative says. Yeah. So I think that he's he's really he's he's trying to put a a final cap on this part of the Belfleur like story. And we know because we've been seeing throughout the novel, like this is not the only way like this family can exist. There are these other branches of the family that are living more or less like normal lives. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just this one like weird like semi inbred like mutant branch like up in this weird inbred mutant castle that's yeah like basically like they're living ghosts and so he's exercising them by doing 911 and hopefully letting his daughter who at some level is like kind of the most openly strange of them at least in terms of kind of her inborn characteristics and yeah. she has these powers. She's also like she's born a hermaphrodite and has like her male genitalia like removed. Uh, though I don't know if Gideon knows that because it, it happens while he's busy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, well, he's busy uh, committing adultery. <laughs> also. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think I think the implication is that he is trying to basically stop her from becoming like a weird fucked up monster. And he's like, I'm going to destroy Belfler Manor so my daughter can be normal. <laughs> Yeah, I so yeah, that's a good point because that does kind of end it. Because I feel like I could um, I could extend the narrative and say like having the Jedediah scene at the end implies that someone's going to do that to their surviving. And maybe they will, but I guess they all got away. But no, but it's I mean, but but it makes more sense that they yeah. quote got away. You know, like like yeah. Well, again, like with Jedediah, it's like at that point he was the only one left, and but. Since then, there yeah. have been these other branches, and so there are other Belfleurs around. And I mean, and again, and that depends on whether or not you think something significant was happening in that last chapter. I mean, obviously, it was from the standpoint that Joyce Carol Oates wrote it, and therefore it has like thematic content, but the thematic content could be nihilistic. It could be like, oh, this is just a, you know, this is not like a, like the, that last chapter is called The Angel. And so I think the, Potential implication is that, yeah, he's running into a divine messenger and this this kind of strange blonde Indian uh, boy. Well, we yeah, we had talked about it because it's interesting that like he's like, oh, I'm up here. I'm trying to find God. And the angel is like, you, you, you're you not finding God. You're you're up here. You're worshiping yourself. You believe yeah. in nothing. <laughs> like, And so then the, the angel is like, do your duty, uh, return to the world. 
uh, start your yeah. family line. And that's like the ending, which is really to me, like it's kind of a fascinating ending because like I think one thing that I, I could say is a slight criticism of this book is that like it all kind of proceeds at the same clip and the same register. And so like there's not a whole lot of changing in format or syntax. It's kind of all the same, which is fine because Joyce Carol is a great writer and I like the kind of gothic style she's doing here. But like, you know, the fact that's how she chooses to end it by going back to the beginning where Jedediah is giving it a choice and he chooses to return to the world and yeah, like do yeah. his duty. Yeah. You know, it's again, it's ambiguous. Like, I, I don't think Joyce Carol Oates is giving us like an easy answer here in terms of like what comes next. Uh, right. And yeah. obviously there's no sequel to this, so it it's meant to be left ambiguous. Well, so to me, that that makes more sense than that in 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 nine eleven in the manner he uh, he he sort of allows the bell flurs to escape yeah, the curse. Yeah. So yeah, so real quick, the so I I do want to talk about my favorite bell flurs because sometimes reading this book it reminded me of Arrested Development and it's just this one big messed up family that like gets into various hijinks. But obviously, it's Bromwell who is the the super serious adult scientific child, and there's a scene early on where. Uh, Bromwell has been secretly keeping track of how long his mother, Leah, has been winning at cards. And this is when she starts to get psychic and she's been winning repeatedly because she's using supposedly psychic abilities to beat these children at cards. And Bromwell's like, look at all these facts and figures. And Leah's like, I'm just good at cards. I'm just better than you. <laughs> like, like, and it's just a great uh, family interaction. Uh, psychic gothic stuff aside is that there's one member of the family who's keeping track of things logically. And the other member of the family is like, what are you talking about? I'm just better. <laughs> like, so I don't know. Bromwell's a great character and uh, I'm glad that he got his sort of like, weird uh uh other life it's like a guy who just lives in an observatory and does science all day uh, and then two vernon the poet somebody we haven't talked about vernon is like the one sensitive uh belfler but as a result he's like a fuck up and everybody hates his poetry they don't like it uh it's implied that he is actually a good poet but sort of like uh again like against his own i would say like judgment and that like like leah at one point gets depressed and she keeps repeating a line of his uh, poetry over and over, which is the jaws devour, the jaws are devoured. Uh, and that's sort of like a kind of like the end is near for the Belflers. And I don't know, Vern is just kind of a hilarious character. And at one point, he's supposed to watch over the child that Gideon had with his first uh, adulterous uh, relationship. And then a bird just flies off with the baby uh, and as a result, he becomes like a Marxist, <laughs> except everybody hates him and then they kill him. <laughs> so he's like trying to like get these people like who work at this uh, bar or work at the sawmill, the Bell Fleurs run to like revolt and they don't want to hear it from him. And so they throw him off a bridge. <laughs> so like well, he's yeah. he's also crucially like he's he's the he he's always insisting that he's not really a Bell Fleur. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Uh, because basically of his like poetic pretensions and like his religious pretensions like he uh is basically like yeah i'm part of the brotherhood of man and i i owe i owe my family no allegiance yeah and then uh then he has an interesting death uh because he became <laughs> kind of like a marxist so i don't know those two characters are great because they're kind of like side characters but I, I i think you get other aspects of this family through them like bromwell the logical serious child and then vernon the sort of like uh, I don't know, uh, spiritually sensitive innocent, <laughs> yeah, sensitive, innocent, that kind of thing. So, yeah, those are my two favorite bell flurs who, uh, you know, aren't a part of the main line, but still pretty good. Yeah, uh, I'd say my two favorites. I really like the kind of I, I, I kind of like the older generations of the family a little more than the younger ones. And maybe that's just because, like, uh, most of the younger ones are like children throughout the novels. So they don't quite get to develop in quite as interesting ways and like their chapters don't kind of have the same digressions mm. but i really like uh grandpa noel uh yeah, who yeah. is just kind of like this this kind of daffy old man but one of the things he he like his kind of big like gothic pretension is that he all he carries around this like elaborate reliquary with cyanide capsules inside of it and just kind of yeah. luxuriously considers committing suicide all the time 
for no particular reason. He just likes knowing that he like has the ability to commit suicide if he chooses to. <laughs> Yeah, um, I love like, that bit where Nightshade is going to poison all the rats. And then and then Grandpa Noah is like, well, if they made a poison, somebody's got to use it. <laughs> everyone's like, what are you talking about? But, but, like, but, but like we know he's like fingering his like poison thing in his pocket. You know, so. so, yeah, I liked him a lot. I found him to be an immensely charming character. <laughs> uh because yeah i just i just love this idea of just yeah this daffy old man just like yeah fingering his his little pill bottle and just being like i could end it whenever i wanted to also isn't he like why can't we just get along like yeah, i feel no, like he's also no, yeah, this thing, yeah. he's also like yeah he's he's definitely like one of the nicest and like yeah kind of like most family minded of the bellflers like he's the one who like takes germaine to like meet the in-laws originally oh, yeah that's who it is yeah 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 and so he's like definitely like kind of he's like definitely like kind of the peacekeeper in the family. But he's also like just very clearly like despite kind of outwardly being like very like placid and peaceful is just like I could end it whenever I wanted to. And all these fuckers would just yeah. have to just watch me commit suicide by cyanide poisoning. <laughs> oh. And I, I it's he says that he uh, he occasionally would like uh replace the pills in the the like reliquary with like fresh cyanide just like to feel like he was like yeah, yeah doing something with it <laughs> uh, and then i also i loved his brother john pierre the second who uh is uh the serial killer in the family <laughs> so he's he's introduced uh as he's been in prison for like decades at the the start of the novel and yeah. getting him out of prison is one of leah's kind of big schemes to like raise the family's like reputation he's yeah. like getting him a pardon uh for this event uh decades prior where like 11 men were like murdered in one night uh after like surreptitiously insulting the bellflers like within listening distance of of uh jean pierre the second yeah and, and then he just basically terminates he, comes, he, comes, like, a, kills he, them. he yeah, comes across yeah. but like at the at the start of the novel like when he like they they get him out and like it seems like oh he really didn't do this he's this just very like soft-spoken like uh uh old man he's like very overwhelmed by like being out of prison like he doesn't really know how to like function in the manor anymore uh, yeah but, did, but then did they describe him as just like sitting in a, wi a room with one window playing solitaire yeah yeah um and then uh but so you you think that the, again maybe maybe he really didn't do it and he really was like wronged in some way uh and kind of again this this kind of gothic uh, twist where it's like oh there was a real murder and you know oh he, he got framed up da 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 uh then there's a strike by the bellfleur workers led by kind of this charismatic like socialist type named sam and uh jean pierre the second uh it says he, he takes like a hog butchering knife he sneaks into like the worker camp murders that guy and like eight of the other like rabble rousers and the strike just ends <laughs> uh, and so you find out like, oh, uh, yeah, he's he's a monster. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets recommitted to the prison. Everyone's like, yeah, hey, you should just go back. <laughs> like, 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 uh, like, <laughs> but it fixed the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like like I, it had been building the kind of like, yeah, the Belflers are monstrous. But like that point just like sealed the deal. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Well, because like I feel like that's the first point where like. Yeah, it's it's that direct. It's like, oh, this is we have like a, a Upton Sinclair style, like socialist hero uh, trying to like get a fair deal for the workers. And then just like, oh, this like insane old fuck, <laughs> like just murders him like with a hog butchering knife. And it's like, OK, like that's the first time like a working class character is like treated as fully human. <laughs> And, he and gets yeah, murked. <laughs> and I would say that like the style doesn't change, but it becomes very reminiscent of like John Steinbeck during the set of description of like the strike and like the fruit becoming so ripe that it needs to be picked and it doesn't. And like, yeah, the the charismatic speeches that the leader gives, like it's very like indubious battle, John Steinbeck, 
But yeah, yeah. then just undercut by you know, a, a serial killer just murdering them with a huge knife. <laughs> like, like. Uh, and then I'm going to cheat a little bit. I also we, we haven't talked about him at all, so I feel like we need to. I don't know if he's going to come up again, uh, but uh nightshade who's not technically a bell fleur yeah but uh, folks there's an evil dwarf (laughs) (laughs) which we need to talk about his introduction because like gideon in this in the forest he comes across of a bunch of dwarves they're hunting for the the giant bird that killed the baby earlier in the book (laughs) (laughs) yeah they're hunting for the and then they then gideon comes across a bunch of dwarves that are like bowling and then they try to kill him (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah like it's like a yeah. it's like a washington irving story like he comes across like this glen full of yeah uh like gnomes like doing like old-fashioned like dutch bowling yeah and they they see him and they just immediately like go beat like go sicko mode <laughs> like try to kill him <laughs> yeah and so then, again in rip van winkle like he like hangs out with them and they're cool but they just immediately try to murder gideon <laughs> yeah and they get like chased off by like the other people he's like hunting for this bird with but they manage to capture this one like no <laughs> and they bring him back to the manor and he becomes like leah's like evil henchman <laughs> <laughs> well yeah and remember they're like should we kill this guy and gideon is like Ah, we can't. (laughs) 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 Yeah, and then they like, so yeah, he he, basically Nightshade starts off like this, yeah, fantastic creature out of like old weird America and then just becomes like a a, a evil hunchback henchman and then at some point just becomes like a normal henchman. (laughs) Like, like, like he starts out like he's like like, back is like getting straighter the longer he's like at the at the manor, which he's definitely like yeah just like a very weird character where it's like he feels like he's the most supernatural like he's able to like brew these like weird poisons like ben said he has this like pied piper kind of chapter where like he brews these poisons like kill all the rodents in the entire manor and it's they say it's like 37 gunny sacks full of dead rodents (laughs) and he takes them all and they're like no one ever figured out what he did with all those bags of dead rats (laughs) Or, or yeah, he had a, an animal made out of other animals in his yeah. pocket that he would then use to scare children. <laughs> like, <laughs> and there's never any explanation for like where these yeah like little people came from or like what they were doing in the woods like bowling. So he he definitely feels like the most explicitly supernatural character, except maybe like uh the the vampire ant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um. Yeah, just a, a great, great character. Love, love when like an evil like henchman shows up and is just an evil henchman, like a goon. And like he maybe like loves Leah too, but Leah doesn't love him because <laughs> Leah is like the queen. So yeah, that it definitely kind of felt like a character with some like missing potential. Like he shows up like two thirds of the way through the book and then he's mostly just kind of there on the side through the rest of it. Yeah. And I kept kind of thinking like, oh, like he's going to be part of whatever the denouement's going to be. And then he's not. And so, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess he just gets killed in the explosion more or less. That, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, they never mentioned otherwise. So you have to assume. <laughs> but I guess if anybody would have made it out of that, probably. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think that's actually a good way to transition into I. Uh, I think it was probably going to be one of our, our final topics. And I know something, Ben, you you really were kind of fixated on as we were reading through this, uh, which is the way that like non-rich people, broadly speaking, are treated in this book. Really non-Bell Fleurs, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, at some level, but uh in particular, like poor and non-white people uh kind of occupy a very interesting place in this text. Yeah, uh, and, I and I think that's where the, the gothic starts to merge interestingly with the realistic aspect, because like just to take one example, the kid that tries to kill Raphael, who likes to hang out at the pond uh, at one point uh, basically kind of like hates the Bellflers and he's trying to force one of the like uh, daughters to go with him by the barn. Um, and they end up killing him. <laughs> they end up stoning him to death and he is in a barn and they light the barn on fire. Uh, now that itself is messed up, but 
routinely throughout the text, he is described as if he is a dog. Like he 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 lolls about like a dog. His tongue hangs out, and then even when characters he dies, literally just like yeah, yeah, say they see a dog when they look at him, and like yeah, they, and so, they only yeah. realize he's a human like kind of halfway through, or like they think they're looking at a human, and then they realize they're looking at a dog. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so that's kind of when I was like, okay, I can sort of see how the gothic becomes like this thing that the Belflers think happens to them and that they're the protagonists of and that they see the outside world through that. And so another example is one of the daughters ends up marrying this uh, gross uh, 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 blacksmith who is at some point just described as a bear. He's just is yeah, a bear. They, they, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, it's kind of a beauty in the beast riff. So yeah. she marries kind of this like wild man who, he, yeah, he like works in the village. He's a blacksmith. And then uh, obviously this like scandalizes the family and then they go like basically they kind of disown her. And then like at some point the brothers like go out and like look at them and like the guy has like they say he's turned into a bear. But the implication is also that maybe they're just poor and like he just has like gotten older. And so he just looks even like rougher and shittier than he did before. Yeah. And they uh, end up hunting him like an animal and killing him. Yeah. And like uh, when she's trying to tell the family about it, she's like, oh, marriage just isn't what I was, you know, thought it was going to be. And I think the implication is like, yeah, she's not as rich as she used to be. And it's like hard to deal with. And so the romance wore off. It didn't. It didn't. uh, Beauty could not tame the savage beast. (laughs) Right. And so, like, I think, you know, and that's kind of I kind of been saying this the whole time, but I think like one of the things that. Oates wants to do in kind of writing an American Gothic story is to sort of use that lens to depict how like, yeah, rich people in America view the rest of the country and their place in it. And it's sort of as like a protagonist in this like tortured monstrous story where everyone else is like a beast or an animal or something supernatural and unexplainable. Like when the the one kid marries a black woman and leaves the family it's like he got sucked into a portal basically yeah and uh and i think that's something that like you know by the end isn't exactly explicitly addressed you know in sort of the plot development but i think is sort of there throughout in how like uh, each story is kind of presented um you know sort of like a sort of riff on this or riff on that or again, also like the fact that Nightshade just becomes like a real person and it's not like an evil demonic dwarf. You know, it's like it's like, oh, he's just the butler. <laughs> like, like yeah. you know, yeah. So no, there's a, yeah. a great passage uh, where Jedediah is like reflecting on what he calls the evils of the Indian. Uh, you know, like Indians. I, I apologize. Native American people. uh I'd say are probably like the the non-white people portrayed most frequently the like black people do appear but it's it's definitely a lot less I think that comes down to like the region this is set in yeah uh but like basically uh uh yeah I, I think this kind of illustrates what what you were saying Ben where, where like Jedediah believes that like the evils of the Indian like predate any of the evils white men have ever done. And in fact, might even predate God <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. uh, th- this way where it's like, yeah, the, the like r- way that like in America, like race becomes this transcendent thing that justifies like the actions of, of white people uh, like even beyond like the professed things that like white people say they believe in like Christianity Right. Uh, yeah. the, the like race hatred like ends up getting like deeper her than that. Uh, yeah. And too, and how the like, yeah, when when they're when the workers are striking and it's a Steinbeck novel, it has to still be a gothic novel. And so they all get like murdered in cold blood. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that, I, there's an interesting kind of like like um I mean, I guess we're going to talk about Harold Bloom. I think there's an interesting kind of Bloomian like anxiety of influence only to the extent that like, you know, Joyce Carol Oates has re- probably read a lot of gothic novels. So she's like, what is mine going to be? And I think having it kind of contend with like American race and class anxieties, I think is a really interesting way to do it. And I think you can see it in like the way the stories progress in the book. Well, I think like uh, in that New York Times review you shared with me, it said that uh, 
that that critic's idea was basically that Joyce Carol Oates is trying to con- like transmute the gothic into high art, and yeah. so sort of taking these these metaphors and and literalizing them or applying them to like contemporary or like semi-contemporary or like maybe eternal like uh american issues uh or maybe perennial instead of uh eternal i, I don't know uh <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to do the thing i just said where i i uh, essentialize this stuff america is uh, older than death <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um i i think that yeah she's she's trying to use these genre tropes in such a way like that she is is using them for all their work that they they go beyond just being these things we're we're reading for uh the sake of entertainment and is actually trying to like say something deeper through them which i think any even people like in genre fiction are trying to do a lot of the time i mean it depends on the genre i think particularly with horror people are generally trying to like make a deeper point uh right. with with what they're writing maybe a little less so with with fantasy fiction uh but i think joyce carol is being kind of having this like literary pedigree is is doing it like kind of maybe on like a a, a more subtle level than than uh some other authors might yeah and and too i and i think that's also kind of like how the book ends and how like yeah the sort of othering that happens through the gothic is kind of just something that happens and i don't know if the book has like an official stance on it if that makes like like there's no like bit where I can say, yeah. oh, this is where well, the like, gothic again, is the, othering. It's I like it just kind of happens. The first time we maybe became yeah. aware of it was with the the farm boy who who kind of is a lycanthrope in a way, and it said like the text just says he turns into a dog, like when yeah. he enters the Belfleur yeah. property, uh, and it's not laid out as like this dramatic thing. Like there's no huh. transformation yeah. scene. Like again, it's not literal necessarily. But he enters like this, this enchanted realm and he's like kind of like, a you know, the men of Odysseus, like he's turned into an animal. Uh, and yeah, kind of by not drawing right. too much yeah. attention to it, by presenting it in this matter of fact way, it both heightens the strangeness of it, but also like mundaneizes it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he gets yeah. murked. To be fair, it does and sound like he raped gets that killed. girl. It's like, <laughs> like I feel like yeah. there's an implication there that he raped the girl who then like she's the one who goes on to like become yeah, an actress. That is, that is true. Uh so she's kind of like forced to leave the family, I think is the implication. Yeah. Um yeah. yeah see, like, All right. So you're either like expelled from the Bell Fleurs yeah. or like, yeah. yeah, you have a you have a doomed uh line. <laughs> so. And that's why Bell Fleur Manor Delenda est. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also liked the bit where they opened the manor for a big party and all of the like people ruined it. Like, like they're like they tra- and it reminded me of uh, Andrew Jackson opening the White House for a party when he was the president. And they like they destroyed all these priceless artifacts because they were just like getting drunk. <laughs> like, like it was it was there's like a nice parallel there along with the, the Abe Lincoln stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I feel like that's a, a pretty good good like summation of of like a lot of the themes and stuff yeah. like uh wh- like ben what what did, what did you like overall think of this book like what do you think it like did gr- good like did you enjoy it like what do you think maybe didn't work i think um i mean i really enjoyed it i will say that i think for such a big book it proceeds with the same kind of like uh narration style pace and clip throughout which like Sometimes, you know, I sometimes like it when I read like a big book. I like when people change it up because it keeps me interested. But like at some point I ended up like going like, ah, this is more of the same. However, what is there is pretty great. It says you've no doubt heard me and John talking about it. There's a lot there to say for how engrossing it is. And the prose is kind of intoxicating and you get all these fantastic scenes. And there's a lot of like sex and description and just the stuff that you're there to read for like it's steamy. It's uh, violent. There's great descriptions of stuff. There's great history. There's funny characters. Um, I, overall, I think it's pretty great. I, I would have liked a little variation, but, you know, I think that would be asking a different author than who Joyce Carol Oates is. And I think this is the book she wanted to write. And I think as far as a take on the gothic, I think it's pretty unique. Uh, and 
Yeah, I wonder if we're just going to have to continue figuring out what American Gothic is, John. If uh, if our <laughs> thesis is uh, that American Gothic is uh, what the lies America tells about itself to get through the day. It's like <laughs> maybe may, yeah, we'll have to find more evidence for that, I guess. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on like the the style, uh, for lack of a better term. Like I definitely found that because it kind of is always in the same register, regardless of like the time period or like the character we're with. Sometimes I felt like I kind of was getting a little lost. like also because there are just so many characters, some of whom have the same names as other characters, because yeah. it's again, like it's a big inbred family and it's like, oh, there's two Jean-Pierre's and it's like, hey, which Jean-Pierre are we talking about right now? And again, because it's moving back and forth in time, like from chapter to chapter, sometimes I feel like I couldn't always keep track of like who was like talking to who, who was operative, like when we were like in the time flow of the yeah. book. But also there's part of me that thinks maybe that was partially intentional. Like I didn't feel right. like I necessarily yeah. like, like, cause again, this isn't a, like a plot book. It's not like I, that because of that, like I missed a crucial detail that like ruined like a big twist or something at the end. Um, Side note. Did you know that a hundred years of solitude originally didn't have a family tree in the front of the book. No, but I'm glad it does. <laughs> yeah, well, right, because like I think in that way, Marquez was like one, he wanted the reader to get confused, and two, there's stuff with the names that would have made it obvious to you know uh, Spanish speakers uh, yeah. than than like Americans. But like they added that later for explanatory purposes, and like this also has a a, a family tree, and I had to keep like referring to it to figure out like yeah, who was yeah. who. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, no. Uh, and even the family tree kind of becomes useless after a certain, like once you go far enough back in time, because it starts with Jedediah. And so everything before that is still like ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I agree with you. I, I think it's like a very interesting, like take on the Gothic that I can't say I've really read anything like it before. Uh, I think the descriptive prose, like kind of moment to moment was really, really beautiful on a lot of times. Like, uh, great passages describing like the fucked up architecture of the house and like uh kind of the moldering like decaying natural settings of the manor that are still like very beautiful in this yeah kind of gothic uh misty way um i also think that like for being 700 pages like this thing did not feel its length like i found it yeah. very breezy most of the time to get through like i was not feeling stuck like I was reading like at a very like quick clip but not feeling like I was missing anything um which is an interesting place to be in with 700 page novel right yeah uh like I got through the bulk of this in like two days which for a 700 page novel feels kind of crazy to say um well yeah and I think that's too because like again I think you're once you're in it it doesn't vary too much like yeah, not, like, yeah you're not getting lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think also just like the fact that it is constant, like the fact that it is changing perspectives and things like there was never a point where I was like, I'm bored. Like, yeah, if yeah. I didn't like a chapter. If I just pushed on through to the next chapter, like, great, we'd be in a doing something completely different. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I really like this. I definitely want to check out more of, uh, JCO's work. Uh, Ben, do you feel like you're going to read <laughs> any more deeply on, on her stuff? Um, I, you know, I think I, I don't have any particular of hers in mind, but I think now if I see her on the shelf, I'm definitely going to go, is this another one of her Gothic ones? And then if it is, I probably will buy it. So, so yeah, <laughs> so, there you go. so I guess we're in the part of the show where we recommend stuff like this. And I think my recommendation is going to be a little bit different because it will be a uh, English Gothic story, not an American one. Uh, but Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen is a fascinating book because it's a book uh, about Gothic novels and the characters in it realize that they're in a Gothic novel. <laughs> so <laughs> and they also discuss Gothic novels. Uh, and so it's sort of Jane Austen doing a riff on uh obviously the plot of a gothic novel like they end up in a mysterious house there's a villainous uncle uh there's various like scooby-doo chases and stuff but the fact that it starts like a realist book and then becomes that i think is really cool and i think when you you know hear of jane austen you usually think of like ah yes yeah, some of the best relationship novels ever written 
And while that's true, it's fun to see her also do kind of like a metafictional thing. And I think that's something we don't really hear often. And for me, being a big metafictional guy, I thought it was pretty fascinating. I had to read it uh, in a history of a novel class a while ago. Uh, and it might obviously be time for a revisit now that I think about it, because it is like pretty interesting in terms of concepts. Uh, and I think it would go nicely with this book as well. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's my recommendation. Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. Wonderful. Uh, my recommendation is going to be one of my favorite short story collections by one of my favorite authors, uh, and that's going to be The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. Uh, Angela Carter, probably my favorite author, actually, if I had to, like, pick a, a top five. But uh, Bloody Chamber is probably her best known work. Uh, it's, again, kind of a in the way this is like a deconstruction of like the Gothic novel. That's very much like they're, they're deconstructions of like the fairy tale, but also generally through kind of like a Gothic lens. Um, I mean, a lot of fairy tales are sources for the gothic so that makes sense uh i'd say as i was like reading through this i was reminded a lot of uh carter's style just the the decadent quality of the prose the uh intertextuality and uh you know constant references and and building back on on kind of older things to say something interesting about contemporary society uh much like uh bell fleur uh bloody chamber is is very interested in like sex and relations between men and women, husbands and wives, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, not the deepest cut in the world, pretty well-known book, uh, but one I deeply, deeply love and which uh, reading Belfleur definitely like got me in the mood to revisit. So uh, yeah, Angela Carter, John, I, don't, I feel like Chamber. a lot of people I know have not actually read Angela Carter. So I don't know if it's that big of a I think it is kind of a deep cut, I would say. I Maybe. Don't I don't know. I mean, for Angela Carter's catalog, it's the the best known one. Oh, OK. OK. That's that's more what I meant. I feel like okay, uh, yeah. more more people have read that than like Knights of the Circus or uh, the Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman. Which uh, great book. Also, uh, John recommended that to me. Pretty great. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I could recommend the whole Carter catalog if you liked this book. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably like her, too. All right. Well. Uh, that, I think, brings us to a close on Belle Fleur. Uh, ben, do you have any, any closing statements before we call it a day? Uh, remember that you are not beholden to the past, uh, despite what your family lineage or myths may tell you. Semper books. Semper books. Thank you for listening to The Infinite Library. If you liked our show, we we'll hope you'll subscribe and leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the podcast app of your choice. It helps us a lot. If you want to follow us on social media, we can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky at Infinite Library Pod. If you'd like to contact our team directly with episode ideas or feedback, you can email us at infinitelibrarypod at gmail.com. Our intro music is by Amos Legend in the Forest of Mayhem. Our outro music is by DJ Daggy Diggs, and our logo is created by Lars Noir. You can support our show by supporting them. We hope you'll join us back in the stacks for the next episode soon. Semper Books, bookheads. <laughs>